Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. In 1984, a classic was released, The Natural, a cinematic experience starring Robert Redford as a baseball prodigy whose career was sidetracked by an unfortunate incident in which an obsessed fan shoots Roy Hobbs, the player he portrayed. Years later, Hobbs finally makes it to the big leagues as an outfielder with the fictional New York Knights. Much has been written about this classic and for whom the career, the fictional, Roy Hobbs was based on. Was it Eddie Wakis of the Philadelphia Phillies? He was shot by a woman. Or could it be loosely based on the career of Billy Jurgis, who was shot in his hotel room by a showgirl with whom he had recently broken up? That's a question we'll wrestle with forever. On this episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes, we'll explore the career of Billy Jurgis and the historic moments of his days with the Chicago Cubs and the New York Giants. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes, episode number 118, Billy Jurgis. Certainly a unique figure when it comes to discussing the history of baseball. As I had just mentioned in today's tease, Jurgis' career was maybe most notable for his relationship with a showgirl, Violet Valley, whom he dated. After breaking it off with Valley, Jurgis, who was living in a hotel in Chicago at the time, heard a knock on his door, and when he opened it, Valley didn't hold back. She pulled a gun and fired away. You see, Valley tried to kill Jurgis for breaking up with her and had written a suicide note as she was going to take her own life after shooting Billy. However, after being shot, Billy wrestled the gun away from Violet and ultimately he never pressed charges, so Violet walked away. That's just part of the Billy Jurgis story. A career 258 hitter, he was a very good defensive shortstop. Somewhat fiery, he had a great understanding of the game. But what makes the Billy Jurgis story even more interesting are these few highlights. He nearly broke the Major League record when he recorded nine straight hits. He was a central figure in Babe Ruth's famous called shot. He was partially responsible for the batting helmet. He was partially responsible for the Nets on foul poles. And he was the manager of the Boston Red Sox during a very significant time in history as he oversaw the integration of the team. And those are just a few of the several highlights of his career. And we're going to discuss these and more with Jack Bales, who recently released a book about Billy called The Chicago Cub Shot for Love. Now, before we get there, I have a favor to ask. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please give Sports Forgotten Heroes a five-star rating. And if you can, write a sentence or two about the podcast. Hey, if you want to let me know how I'm doing, have suggestions for more podcasts, have a question, or just want to say, hey, please reach out to me at sportsfh.info at gmail.com. That's sports, 
fh.info at gmail.com. You can follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at SportsFHeroes. Look for the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook or check out my website, sportsfh.com. Here, I have more information about the Forgotten Heroes I talk about, an archive to past episodes, and so much more. That's sportsfh.com. As always, thanks for your support. Okay, let's get into today's show about the Chicago Cub shot for love. My guest and author, Jack Bales. And joining me now, Jack Bales. Jack, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm just delighted to be here, too. I'm thrilled that uh, we could connect. And I got to tell you, I am so interested in this story, Billy Jurgis. And I got to ask, where does your interest in Billy come from? Well, uh, I, uh, thanks for asking that, Warren. I, I grew up outside of Chicago in Aurora, Illinois, and I've, and I've enjoyed uh, researching and writing for, for, for many years. I was working on a Cubs book on the, uh, on the 19th century Cubs. In fact, the title of it is Before They Were the Cubs. And I read about the shooting and a few Cubs histories. But the authors just gave only a few cursory comments here. And, uh, fact, and then I started doing a little bit of work on my own. The Chicago Tribune wrote, about the 1932 Cubs that, quote, uh, never before was a team beset with more irritating experiences apart from the playing of baseball. And number <laughs> one on their list and number one on the sporting news list was this shooting of Billy Jorgas. And after that, I just got hooked. Sure. Do, do, do you think, um, or when you first watched the movie, The Natural, did you know much about Billy at that point? No, not at all. And of course, I had seen the natural uh, and everything. And uh, and that uh, Bernard Malamud never really talked about uh, his uh, his sources for that book. But there, I would think there would be it was a good sh- chance that 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 he modeled uh, the shooting of Roy Hobbs there on uh, uh, Billy Jurgis, or maybe perhaps Eddie Wakeus, who got shot in uh, uh, September ninth, nineteen forty seven. Yeah, it's so interesting that um, that this movie really, uh, The Natural, Billy and Eddie Wakeus both playing for the Cubs, yeah. and you could sort of take a little bit out of each of their story and combine it into one person, and that would be Roy Hobbs. So Roy how Hobbs. much of the movie do you think is the influence of Georges and, and, and Wakis. Well, that's a, that's, a, you know, and, and you know, the, the two of them played together for two years. And in fact, Wakis had hit a, a double in Jurgis's last game, uh, on September 9th, 1947. I'm sorry. The book was in 1952. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, I see. It. I haven't seen the movie in a, in a long time. I read the book a while ago. I had to see the book, so I really can't say. But there's there's certainly some some similarities there. Uh, uh, there was some drama with uh, with the manager of the team, as I recall, in the movie and in the book. And there was certainly some drama with Rogers Hornsby with Billy with Billy right. Jorgis and the right. Cubs too. I mean, that was yeah. We'll get thing, into that. We'll 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 yeah. definitely get mm-hmm. into that because I certainly have that that written down. And, you know, you hit on a great point. I find it so interesting that the two of them were teammates for a short period of time. Yeah. Talk about the irony of the two actually being on the (laughs) same team and both actually being shot, albeit years apart, and by two different women who were basically obsessed with them. Obsessed with them. And they must have talked about it. I mean, forgot after Eddie got shot, you know, I'm sure Billy probably contacted him, you know, because he, he was pretty, Billy was pretty gregarious after he retired and everything. And he was always talking to his old baseball friends and everything. So uh, they must have gotten together, which I just would have loved to have heard that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, the woman, and, and we're going to concentrate on Billy and not Eddie, So we're going to dive a little deep here into 
Billy and his story. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the woman, if you can, who shot Billy, Violet Valley. Tell us what you can about Violet. Well, uh, she she was kind of unfor- uh, just kind of had an unfortunate life, I guess. And uh, uh, and I profiled her in my book, and there's and there's a photo. I have a lot of photographs of her, and there's one I know she's just sitting sitting here in, in a doorway with a this I can only say a sweet smile on her face, and she just looks so innocent. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, in just a few years she'd be pulling a gun out of her uh, out of her purse, but. Uh, uh, her father was an, uh, was an immigrant, an Austrian immigrant who arrived at Ellis Island, I think, in 1907. He was an electrician, and he got married to a fellow Austrian, uh, and they had four children, of which Violet was the oldest. She was born in 1911. But the marriage was not a happy one. And when Violet was only uh, 10 days old, her father began beating his wife, giving her black and blue eyes. Mm. Uh, the couple got divorced in 1920, and Violet, an eight-year-old Violet even had to testify at the divorce hearing. And so that undoubtedly was a traumatic effect on her, which I, I, I can't help but think that's what led her to, to just, I, I think she just wanted to get married and have a happy life. And that's why she probably latched on to Billy, you know, because she liked, she liked baseball and, and she liked baseball players. And, and that I'm sure had something to do with that. I mean, she had to, she spent her uh, early years in an orphanage in Chicago, the Ulick children's home, along with their brothers, because the father refused to pay a lot of child, to pay the, the correct so, uh, child support. And uh, the mother simply couldn't afford them. Uh, uh, she said in interviews that she was married when she was 18, but it was a very short marriage. I think the quote was, uh, I was unhappily married at 18, one of those puppy love affairs with a schoolboy. I never lived with them, and we were divorced six months later. Uh, she enrolled in a dancing school, and she, she became a showgirl with Earl, uh, uh, Earl Carroll's Vanities, which was an annual musical produced by this, by this showman. Uh, and then... Um, that opened in February 1930, and early 1931, uh, or, or uh, I'm sorry, in the summer of 1931, she met she met Billy Jorgis then. But, yeah, uh, so she's just an unhappy person. Yeah. yeah. So, so tell me about their courtship and how they met, and and what the relationship was like before the shooting. Okay. Uh, they. Uh, uh, I remember Bada said in an in an interview that. Uh, uh, to see how did how did he phrase it now? Um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh yeah, she said that uh, I met Billy at a party in the summer of 1931, and if uh, uh, he was a boy and 100,000 for me, and uh, if it wasn't love at first sight, it was just about uh, just about second. And <laughs> that was on the su- <laughs> the summer of 1931. So they went out an awful a, a great deal, and and. Uh, and uh, uh, Billy really liked her. She was a beautiful woman. Uh, I, I corresponded with her uh, and talked on the phone quite a bit with her nephew, uh, Mark Prescott. And uh, he, he emphasized, and, and, and the photos of my book show this, too, that she was just very, very beautiful, uh, very stat- statuesque almost. She was dark-haired, attractive, outgoing, uh, five feet, nine inches tall. Uh, and so she was, you know, rather, rather tall person. And, and then later in an interview back in 1988, I think, Billy said, well, uh, he, he enjoyed going out with her because she was beautiful. And uh, he said, why, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't I like to go out with her? But he said he was also committed to, you know, he was single. He was also committed to having a good time. And he was committed to the Cubs, too, because he thought they had a good chance uh, to win the National League pennant. But... Uh, but anyway, and in fact, in the in the summer of 1932, the Cubs were in the middle of a of a of, of a real tight pennant race. And in yeah. early July of 1932, they were they were just a few games out of first place. Uh, and they were playing in the, in in uh, uh, in Brooklyn you know, at one point in in, in the summer, and and Barlow had been in New York uh, doing some modeling and they, they got together and she watched the game and everything and uh, but they, they had a quarrel they never really said what the quarrel was about but I'm, I'm pretty sure from later interviews that he wanted to break up break off the relationship concentrate more on baseball and she, she did not take it uh, uh, particularly well uh, and so some of the players were staying at a place called the Hotel Carlos which is 
still in the, it's just still in existence. It was just remodeled a while ago, and it's oh, uh, wow. now it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, like a condominium or offers a, a studio apartments to young professionals there on Sheffield Avenue, just a couple of blocks north of Wrigley Field, and at uh, uh, about 9:45 in the morning of July 6, uh, Billy was getting ready for a game with the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, when when Bodet called him from her room, she stayed there too. It was a residential hotel back then. Uh, she stayed in room five, uh, uh, stayed in room one eleven, and said she wanted to see him. And he told her to come on up to his room, room five oh nine. About ten fifteen, she knocked on his door. They started talking. Uh, uh, they resumed. Argue, uh, they started arguing again. Uh, he, she hadn't seen him all this time. Be, uh, all this time, so she made a point to try to see him. And as and I got the point from reading the interviews that he was kind of just nonchalant. You know, you open the door, hey, come on in, what do you want to talk about? And that kind of ticked her off right there because, you know, she wanted to talk about their relationship. So at one point she asked him for a glass of water. And while he went to get it, you know, she pulled a gun out of her purse. And as they say in the movies, you know, uh, they struggled and and three shots rang out, you know, Mm. uh, wounding them both. But not seriously. And, and and one bullet struck him in the right side, bounced off a rib, and came out the right shoulder. And from what I read, that, that bouncing off the rib is what saved his life, because that would have definitely hurt something, hurt a vital organ if it continued. Uh, another one grazed a little finger of his left hand, and the third bullet hit Violet's left hand, about the, about the base of her thumb, and went up her arm about six inches, and both of them were taken to the nearby uh, Illinois Masonic Hospital. And, and did she ultimately try to, uh, did she attempt suicide at some point? Well, that's that's funny, too, because uh, um, right after the shooting, uh, right after the shooting, uh, police searched Violet's room and they found a note addressed to her brother. And, and the note said, uh, quote, to me, life without Billy isn't worth living but why should I leave this earth alone? I'm going to take Billy with me. And so she said in this note that she was going to kill Billy and, and kill herself. Uh, she later said that the note was a result of, quote, too much gin, and that she only wanted to kill herself to show Billy just how much she loved him and to make him sorry for breaking up with her. In fact, uh, she said in an interview that when uh, Billy was out of the room getting her that glass of water, uh, quote, uh, let me see. I, I pulled out my revolver intending to kill myself. Bill saw me and grabbed the gun. We fought for it. We really fought for it. The gun kept exploding. I didn't want to hurt him, you know. Mm. Uh, but if I may, may jump ahead quite a few years, that really isn't true because I talked to Violet's and she's maintained this all, all the time that she only wanted to shoot herself. And then Billy refused to press charges, in fact. And so, you know, nothing happened. But in late, I talked to Violet's uh, nephew, and he told me that Violet was talking to uh, uh, Mark's mother, and, and, and Mark overheard her tell the mother, quote, uh, I, uh, they were talking about the whole incident, and she, and she said something like, uh, I was very angry, and I wanted to kill him. Mm. And so Mark said definitely that she went in there with murder on her mind. Wow. Wow. They had to, then they struggled for the gun, you know, and then the, the three shots rang out during a struggle. I think the New York Times said something like uh, Billy made a wild lunge for the gun. Mm. So she was truly obsessed with him. You know, years back, I did an episode about Kai Kai Kyler. What a terrific, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, what yeah. a terrific yeah. ball player. Right. Uh huh. You know, and at the time of this incident, Kyler was a teammate of Billy's. Yeah. There are reports that Kyler convinced or at least talked to Billy to break up with Violet. Do you know if that's true? And if so, or and if, if you heard that and and what was behind Kai Kai's motivation to break up the couple? Well, in fact, in uh, in that letter from Violet uh, that Violet left in her hotel room. Part of it reads something like she was really upset because, quote, uh, let's see, gossips began casting aspersions on my character. And one of them was Kai Kai Kyler. He, he, he had heard rumors and uh, 
Al Lopez, who was playing for Brooklyn at that time, had heard rumors too that um, Violet was, you know, kind of dating around, and uh, she had a lot of other boyfriends too. And and Kai Kai Kyler warned Billy off from her, and I think, in, and he also wanted him to concentrate on baseball. I think in one interview he said something like, uh, uh, "I I I just kept telling Billy that uh, if he stuck to baseball, he'd be a star." But you know, Violet dated. Kai Kai Kyler too before oh, she before oh. she oh yeah she dated Kai Kai <laughs> Kyler in the in the spring of 1931 I think it was before they met she met Billy in the summer of 19 uh, or maybe the summer of late fall of 1931 she dated Kai Kai Kyler and she said in an interview that uh, she she dated him but then she stopped dating him when she found out he was married uh, Kai Kai Kyler in an interview said. That was not true. That she never dated him. I only saw her. She, she, uh, he said, when at uh, when was signing autograph pro autograph uh, when he was autographing programs or baseball, you know, thank cards or whatever. That's the only time uh, he ever saw her. And later on, and when Billy did an interview in 1988 with uh, Jerome Holtzman. Uh, the, then the uh, baseball's national historian. He said, no, he says, Kai Kai Kyler was a real womanizer and he was dating, dating a lot of people. And he was especially uh, dating about it for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, I want to get into the kind of ball player that Billy was. And the title of this podcast, Sports Forgotten Heroes, and to call someone a hero because he was shot, um, you're not a hero. But yeah. he did have a decent career. And in just a bit, we will get into some of the key contributions to the game oh, inadvertently yeah. or purposely that Billy made. But mm -hmm. before we get there, I'd like for you to tell me about his career. Of course, he was no Roy Hobbs, but <laughs> no. he, he, he was <laughs> he was a three time all star. So what yes, kind of was. ball player was Billy Georges? He, he was a uh, well, he was a real scrapper for starters. So, I mean, he 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 was in there to, to win and he did not hesitate to drop the old gloves and start fighting. Uh uh, and and I and I go into that in a lot of my book. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, the baseball player Dick Bartell, who was who played for the I think the Philadelphia Phillies, he said that they uh, he didn't get along with them like uh, without Billy. Like uh, uh, they did not not get along like oil and water it was more like gasoline and matches. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> every time every you know, Billy was at at at, at, at uh, a shortstop. He was a shortstop, and so. Uh, he sometimes had to cover second base, and the players would try to spike spike Billy and uh, yeah. and, and knock him down. And he got quite a few gases on his legs, and he was getting the more he was thrown out of at least five games, maybe four or five games. And he was getting in fights with Dick Bartell and other and other people. But and he, but he was not a very good hitter. I think his uh, 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 his his average uh, yeah, was I think 258 in uh, 1,816 games, and uh, he 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 was he spent 17 years in the major leagues from 1931 to 1947, but he led the National League shortstops in fielding percentage four times, uh, 32, 35, 37, 39, and once in double plays turned. He was really big on turning double plays. Uh, Later on, when he played for the when he was managed the Boston Red Sox, it was a disastrous time with the mm -hmm. Boston Red Sox. Mm -hmm. He really got on Pumpsy Green, the very first African American right. player for uh, not turning the double plays. I remember he said, "You know, a professional baseball player makes those double plays." Mm -hmm. But uh, but he only batted two fifty eight. He got, got a, a, a one thousand eight hundred and sixteen games. But I, I, I said that he. I think he compensated for that with his really solid defensive skills. Yeah, and that was his main contribution. Yeah, I, I would say that when you look at his overall career, it's about the contributions he made in the field as opposed to what he did at the plate. Not saying that a 258 hitter isn't a solid ball player. And he did on a couple of occasions uh, get votes in the MVP race. Yes, uh huh. Yeah, he sure, he certainly did. He, I don't know if he knew this, but he also, 
he got beamed a couple times. And yeah, won, I want to get uh, into that. I, I do <laughs> yeah, want to get yeah. into that. But but, but before we go okay. there, you know, and well, we we are about to get there. You and and one of the one of the things I really enjoy about my podcast, Sports Forgotten Heroes, is this: the research. When looking for heroes that I'd like to talk about and doing the research on them, you uncover and discover so many interesting things. Yeah, in the case, really yeah, in, in the case uh-huh. of Billy, yeah. he played a role in many, I guess, important advances in the game, issues in the game. And he also was around for one of baseball's most legendary moments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up different aspects to his career. And I don't want you to jump ahead. I just want you to concentrate on that one particular aspect. And I'd like for you to tell us about it. Mm -hmm. And let's start with perhaps the most famous of all of them, the legendary (laughs) called shot. In the 1932 World Series by Babe Ruth. And, of course, Billy uh, and, and, and that cold shot is mm-hmm. the background for your book, The yes. Chicago Cub Shot for Love, A Showgirl's Crime of Passion, and the 1932 World Series. Jack, there is so much here to discuss Billy oh, yeah. having been shot by Valley and coming back, yeah. losing right. his position, the dismissal right. of their manager, Rogers right. Hornsby, <laughs> exactly new manager, right. Charlie <laughs> Grimm, former Yankee, yeah. Mark Koenig, player yeah. shares of the World Series bonus. Yeah. So much. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so much here. Yeah. Well, I guess let's actually start with Billy returning to the team after he recovered from being shot. Right. What changed? Okay, well, you know, first of all, uh, he rejoined the team on July 22nd, about a week after the, the arraignment, by the way, too, when, when he refused to press charges. And uh, um, they lost to Pittsburgh on that day, and, they found, and the Cubs found themselves three and a half games behind the league-leading Pirates. And everyone was under a lot of stress because William Beck, the uh, uh, the manager thought that they would not the manager, but the president thought that the Cubs would uh, would easily win the National League pennant. But uh, uh, the team's talented, but rather disagreeable, very hard to get along with. Manager Rogers Hornsby kept complaining to Beck about how awful the team was, and and, and the players are getting tired of it too. Uh, and uh, he was going. Beck was getting weary of. Horry's been his constant complaining, and uh, things got getting worse. A loss to the Brooklyn Dodgers on August 2nd put the Cubs five games behind the, the first place Pirates, and that evening, Duck fired Hornsby and appointed as manager the you know, very popular first baseman and team captain, uh, uh, Charlie Grimm. Now, and so the Cubs have really got it going on a roll now. So, but anyway, Beck was concerned about Billy's recovery right after the shooting, and moreover, there was also the loss of how Hornsby after he got fired. And so uh, Beck brought in the infielder, Mark Kennig, to help out, who used to play with the Yankees. And he proved to be an excellent choice as he helped the Cubs clinch the National League pennant on September 20th. They got the National League pennant. Now, each team would get a share of the World Series gate receipts, and the players got to vote on how much each person got. And, uh, but to get a full share, it had to be unanimous. The two Cubs players, and I found out, who they were, uh, who they were in a, in a Cubs history that they they were Billy Jurgis and Billy Herman, who was who made the Hall of Fame, uh, an excellent second baseman. Uh, they voted not to give Mark Kennedy a full share as he played in just the last part of the season, 30, 33 games. Uh, the other but people, he hit, but he hit three fifty three, <laughs> cranked yeah, out uh-huh. three homers, knocked in a exactly. couple, uh, uh-huh. was was solid in the field. And yeah. you know, um, wow! I you know that's that 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 was one of the more surprising things. And he his career obviously with the Yankees over, and yeah. um, he had found his way back to the majors yeah. after have you know toiling in the minors. 
Yes, um, exactly right. Uh-huh. What what did the Cubs see in 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 Mark to go out and sign him? Well, uh, Beck brought him in, and I th- and I think he really wanted someone in the infield. And I think uh, 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 he Kenny was a really a good player in the infield. He played again. He played for the Yankees. And he played for the minor leagues. And and Kenny saw something in them. I, uh, as I recall, I can't remember the the scout's name, but a scout really recommended him. Uh, to to William Beck, and that's what clinched the deal. And uh, uh, he he brought him in. Uh, his uh, uh, he, he was fired on August second, and Mark Kennig's first game was August fourteenth. And then in for a few days, he was a pinch hitter or a defensive defensive replacement. But you know, the, I don't know why they didn't vote him a full share. I remember Woody English. Uh, he even made the comment in an interview years later. Well, he, you know, he he won the National League pennant for us. And I think, I think in retrospect, I think Woody English, uh, uh, third baseman, would would have would wish that he did get a he would have gotten a full uh, a, a full share because uh, as a sports writer Shirley Povich wrote, uh, Shirley Povich, by the way, is a, a famous Washington Post sports writer, the father of the talk show host Maury Povich, in fact. Right. But but he wrote quote the Cubs stinginess fired the Yankees to new heights and then the, they the, and the newspapers were full of all the comments back and forth especially from Babe Ruth calling the Cubs skin flints and penny pinchers and uh, uh, and he was saying stuff hey Mark better grab that half share of the bonus now the Cubs are so stingy they'll probably uh, take it from you and. Uh, and so there was all this name calling, Warren, back and forth in the games, and really brutal name calling too. Uh, really, really tough stuff. You know, back then it's called bench jockeying back then, uh, uh, when they just call names to each other back and forth. But the Cubs were down two games to none in the World Series. See, the Cubs were playing the Yankees in the World Series. Uh, the Yankees won their pennant. Right, uh, and that's and, they, and again that's Mark's former team, and yes. like you said, at this point, Babe Ruth knew about the stinginess of the Cubs players right. um, not voting full shares to 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 Mark. And um, Babe Ruth wasn't happy about it. No, he wasn't happy at all. And he, he made all he he uh, gave an interview. I know at the Tribune, it's called Tribune. He said, uh, uh, they're, uh, I hope we beat them four straight. They're cheapskates and I tell them so. You know, you know, they didn't vote Mark, a, you know, a full share of the whole of the World Series money, which really was a dumb move. Uh, so and then the game three was played in Chicago. The Cubs were down two to nothing. The insults were flying back and forth between the teams. The Chicago crowd was screaming encouragement at the Cubs. They were screaming abuse at the Yankees. And in the fifth inning, the score is tied four to four. And Ruth was at the plate facing pitcher Charlie Root, who was really a hard nosed pitcher. Uh, and this count was at two balls and two strikes. And so Babe Ruth raised two fingers of his right hand. Uh, and did he signal that that was only two strikes? Did he gesture, you know, contemptuously to the Cubs in the third base dugout? Did he gesture to Charlie Root, the pitcher? Uh, or did he point to center field as if to signal that he was going to hit a home run? You know, that is, uh, did he call his shot? And of course, he did hoit a home run, uh, uh, and he's down on the bases, laughing to it, laughing to himself, and it's, and, and saying, "You lucky dog, you lucky dog." Uh, I think I think Franklin D. Roosevelt was in the crowd, and he was laughing uh, that, that then too. Uh, nobody nobody knows, and nobody remembers that Lou Gehrig stepped up to the plate and hit a home run right after that, which you know really just that just kind of blew it right there. Uh, and everything. I mean, the Cubs, the thoroughly de- demoralized Cubs, lost the game, and then uh, they in fact they went down uh, four games to nothing, just as uh, 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 Babe Ruth had hoped. But the thing is, Warren, and I and I get into this in the book. I didn't and I didn't know about this at the time. Uh, you know, the the whole did he or didn't he call his shot that does not fall along partisan lines at all because I found Cubs players, Woody English, who was probably the the Cubs principal heckler he kept 
to his dying day, said, when I was there, I saw, you know, he, he pointed to center field and he was a Cub player. But then I saw, and uh, other Cubs said he didn't, you know, Charlie Grimm said he didn't, catcher Gabby Hartnett said he didn't, Billy Jurger said he did not. But then I saw Yankees players who some of them said he did call it, but uh, uh, some of them said just as emphatically, well, of course he didn't. We, we just, the uh, reporter Joe Williams of the New York World Telegram wrote, you know, he, he called his shot as he put Homer number two out, something like that. And uh, that was where it first got that, at first, that expression called it shot first got his play in that in that newspaper column the next the next day but uh but but the new york yankees some of them just said well we knew it was a good story we were just going to let it lie that's all and uh but some other yankees said he did uh said he did some yankees said he did not uh I kind of go with what charlie grimm later said something like uh you know the greatest hitter in in the history of baseball hit that home run. You know, does it really matter? Only Babe Ruth would have the charisma to fill the ballpark all the time and to to capture the whole spirit of baseball with that home run. Mm, mm. Well, um, wow, what a story. Well, did did Billy play any other role in that, or that's, that's just how it went down? Yeah, that's just how it went down. He did not. I, I can't remember if he had a couple of hits. No, yeah, he got he got a he scored a he got a hit and the Cubs got a, a run off of him. He mm-hmm. had an RBI that game. I okay. think it was. So, okay. or maybe he got he scored a run and was hit in. But he mm-hmm. he did play a role in that particular game. Mm-hmm. He made one of the first. I think he did make one of the first runs. But he didn't have anything to do with that particular uh, p- particular um, uh, 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 incident. Mm-hmm. But he did play a role in some other things. And the next one I want to talk about. Oh, I know what's coming up. Is the batting <laughs> helmet. I want to talk about the batting yeah. helmet first. He was yeah. hit by a pitch, suffered a uh-huh. concussion. And this ultimately led to protective wear for batters. Yes, talk about it that. It did. It eventually led to it. And I, I, can't, I have to admit, I can't remember the name of the player. I think, I think it might have been 1935. It but, was, uh, I, I, I thought it was maybe Bucky Walters or something. Oh, it, it was. It was. Uh-huh, because he kept on. He ran up to the to the to the bat to the batter's box. He said, "I'm sorry, Billy. I'm sorry, Billy. It just got away from me." And and, the, and Billy kept just saying, "That's okay, Bucky. That's okay." You know, <laughs> and everything because he knew it wasn't on purpose. You know, and everything. But eventually, uh, uh, and I go into this a little bit in the in the, in the book that uh, uh, that led to protective gear for the players. And event one team uh, started wearing them. Uh, and then eventually, all all the teams they were they were required to wear batting helmets. But he definitely played a big role. He definitely played a big role in that because he was he was out for a while and he kept getting headaches for a long time. He, he was really really hurt that day, you know. Well, one of the other big contributions to the game, inadvertently, I would say, are the nets on foul poles. And um, I think that this came about because of a home run that was or wasn't. And um, it was Billy and an umpire by the name of George Magerkirth. I think that was yeah. Magerkirth. I'm uh-huh. not sure how you pronounce his name. No, but I'm not sure uh, either. Mm-hmm. but we'll call him George. So George yeah. uh-huh. and Billy had a uh, had a uh, uh, a little uh, disagreement. A disagreement, yes. And, uh, and tell the, us about uh-huh. that incident and uh, how that led to the uh, net on a foul pole. Yeah, well, uh, the, uh, they had a disagreement and uh, 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 about a pitch ball. And everything, and then the, uh, and then the, uh, the, Billy got in the umpire's face, and I guess Billy was chewing tobacco, and the umpire was chewing tobacco, and Billy was yelling so loud, uh, yelling so much, he accidentally, you know, spit some of the tobacco on the umpire's face, and so the umpire had was started spitting deliberately at Billy, <laughs> and it went back and forth, back and forth, 
and I and Billy was fined, and I think the umpire might have been fined a well, little they, bit Well, they too. were both yeah. fined, and from what I fined, read, yeah. they were yeah. both suspended for ten they were games. Suspended, yeah. uh-huh. well, since yeah. when does an umpire get suspended? But this umpire, I mean, it was pretty unusual for an umpire to be suspended. The blown call. They later became yeah. friends, and they kind of joked about it in later years. Well, how did this lead to the net on the foul poles? You know, I have to admit, I, I don't remember that part of it, though. I remember reading about the incident, but you probably know more well, about what it. I, what I read, yeah. and I was trying uh-huh. to lead you there, what I read was yeah. um, the ball was foul, and the umpires the missed part, it, yeah. and they called it a home run, and shortly yeah. thereafter, baseball put the nets down the foul pole in the foul side, so in case yeah. a ball is ever that close – you can tell whether or not it's fair right. or foul. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, so yeah. there's a another great incident that Billy yeah. was involved in that had a, uh, uh, while it was a negative at that particular moment, ended up being a positive in the contribution that that incident yeah. actually um, made to the game. And I want to jump way ahead now. And you brought up the name earlier, Pumpsy Green. So mm-hmm. Billy was the manager of the Red Sox, uh, surprisingly named manager in 1959. And he was there and played a major role in the integration of the Boston yeah. Red Sox. The, the last team, I believe, to to integrate uh, mm-hmm. with having an African-American suit up for the team. Talk about that. Okay. Uh, after Billy, Billy left, the, uh, left the Cubs, uh, he, he, you know, he, he, he played for the Giants, and he, and, 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 but he always, wanted to, uh, he, he always wanted to manage. That was his, that was his big thing. He says, uh, you know, the, the lightning only strikes once, he said, and I really wanted to strike for me. So uh, this was a 1959. He got traded. To, uh, she got traded to the Giants after the 1938 season. Stayed with them to 1945. Then he was a, a scout and a minor league manager. And so in 1959, he got the call to be a manager of the Boston Red Sox, and he just lo- he just loved this. And uh, and one of the he had a he had a pretty decent team. He thought one of the players was you know the mighty left fielder Ted Williams. Uh, but he retired in 1960 and couldn't help Billy much. And he and he and Billy got along great, for they both were hard working and they hustled. But in the late 1950s, unfortunately, hustling was not a part of the Red Sox vocabulary. <laughs> and, and I and uh, I wrote that there was kind of a, a decided air of complacency had surrounded the team. Um, and now I can't remember. Oh, J- uh, was it J- Jackie Jensen? I think was a player on the team, and mm-hmm. he was a. He was a really good outfielder, but he had a fear of flying, and he, he retired in 1962, so he wouldn't have to fly. Uh, uh, and, but, and Billy did his best, and, uh, when, but he didn't, get along with, he didn't get along too well with the players because he kept pushing them and pushing them. Like, and Pumpsy Green, the whole integration of Pumpsy Green as the last African American, the last team to become integrated, was kind of overshadowed by Billy's constantly making the newspapers for some of the things he said to the players and uh once uh, there was an interview in the with a player in the christian science monitor which was published in boston and he demanded he called a team meeting and invited, invited the sports people said okay who's this who gave this interview here come on stand up and tell have have you have them tell us all about it and of course nobody did that really wasn't the way to handle something like that uh by 1960, he started getting along with the players, but the, the talent wasn't there. And uh, in fact, later on, he admitted he said something like, uh, uh, "What was it? Uh, a manager has to have a team with players that are going up." All my players were at the end of their careers, and there wasn't much uh, I could go, I could do here. And, and he was let go in June 1960 with a really disappointing uh, major league managerial record of, of 59-63, you know, 59 wins, mm-hmm. uh, 63 losses, and a you know, winning percentage of 484. Uh, and I've talked to Boston Red Sox fans. I thought from the newspaper reports, 
And I read all that. I went to the Boston Herald, you know, page by page, and the Christian Science Monitor, and, and the, the, the reporters were pretty brutal on him, but some of them recognized that he was doing his best with, with, a, with a team that really was kind of mediocre. Uh, but some of the, the, my diehard Red Sox fans, he said, oh, no, he wasn't that good of a manager. And, uh, uh, but anyway, he, he, but he did hustle. Um, he finished his career as a very, very well-respected baseball scout and instructor. Right. And, some, and some major league players, oh, they're a Hall of Fame. You know, they were a Hall of Fame. Uh, 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 Induction um, to him. Induction in the Hall of Fame, largely due to, uh, to uh, due to Billy, you know, uh, and everything. So, well, with uh, with Ted Williams in the lineup, he was forty four and thirty six. Without Ted Williams in the lineup, he was fifteen and twenty seven. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. why why do you think he was never given another chance to manage after that? Did he not want to, or was his reputation stained after going fifteen and twenty seven? <laughs> yeah, I think a little bit. Of- of uh, both there, I know he, 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 he went on like a medical leave uh, right before he got fired. And in fact, the doctor said something like, "You know, this this man is going to die. He's going to have a stroke if he doesn't get a little break here." Mm. Because Billy was just literally, you know, tearing his hair out, so to speak. And uh, uh, you know, what 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 am I doing wrong here? You know, and uh, well, why can't this team improve? And they, they did win up three or four in a row for a while. And he was being encouraged. He was encouraging to the players and they were coming around a little bit but there just wasn't much talent and uh and so um he he said after he got fired he was just going to go move back home and take it easy for a while and see what happened and then instantly he got all these demands to be a, a baseball scout during spring training and uh uh, also being an instructor too, so he was on the go all the time, scouting and and and, and teaching and everything. And uh, but right before he died, he, he his his I interviewed his daughter and his grandson especially, and his and, uh, and his grandson told me that uh, he went on he went on the road with Billy as a scout, and he you know he got to shake hands with all these important players, and they all really respected Billy, and, and I think he told uh, uh, a major league team. You know, I have my eye on this guy right over here. You know, be sure and sign him. He'll be really good for your team. And and right before he died, he was pleased to learn that the team did indeed uh, did indeed shoot him. Mm, mm. Uh, shoot him. Did indeed uh, right. hire him. Hire him. Or sign sign him. Yeah. And sign him. Right. Shoot him. Sign him. Yeah. Um. Let's go back to his playing career. Let's talk about his temperament on the field. We sort of touched upon it. He was. Pretty aggressive, pretty fiery. I mean, this guy was ejected 12 times during his career. And (laughs) I don't know if you can, if you could talk about the one incident where he threw a ball into the Phillies dugout and then threw another one causing a bench clearing brawl. Talk about how fiery and aggressive he was. Yeah. Well, that was it. And, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I cover that in my book or not, but I didn't even remember reading about that. That he was just really, I, I think, uh, I think he was sliding into second base or something, or maybe he might have been covering second base. But that the, you know, the, the players when they round to second base would try to take out the second baseman or whoever was covering the shortstop. He was covering second base, and uh, and Billy got spiked. Or and he nimbly jumped out of the way. And then I know he started yelling at the Phillies dugout, and the Phillies people in the Phillies dugout started yelling at him back. And so he took a had a baseball, threw it in the dugout, and then he took a second baseball and threw it in the dugout. And the players were <laughs> scattering all over the place, and uh, uh, Billy got fined. And I think he got ejected that time too. Well, like you said, he was a pretty likable guy, and I think proof of that is what happened in 1935. He spiked Cookie Lavagetto, and later yes. those two became yes. best of friends. They became best of friends, and Cookie got him uh, uh, got him a job uh, working with the with the Washington team, I think it was. And he later he called him one of his best friends. In fact, right right after Billy was hired by the by the Boston Red Sox. He and Cookie had lunch together and, and he was, you know, milking Cookie's brains for all this good advice on what to do. They were very, very good friends. You know, he, they just, he just, uh, you know, he gave him a, he gave Cookie a lot of credit. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, and, and I think at one point they might've been roommates. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It could have been. Yes. Uh-huh. Do you know anything about 
the fight he had with his own teammate, Walter Stevenson, and it had something to do oh, with yeah. Stevenson's yeah. grandfather and the Civil War. Yeah, I remember reading about that. Uh, and I think after that happened, that, well, it was that uh, he was a Southerner, the Walter Stevenson, and, and Billy started making fun of his grandfather on the, uh, playing, in the, uh, playing in the Civil War, I think it was, a grandfather, a great-grandfather. And uh, he said he probably just carried a, a corn husk as a rifle in the Civil War. He wasn't probably brave enough to carry a rifle. And uh, he was needling them all the time, and they had a really a big fight. And infuriated the manager, Charlie Grimm. And he sent Walter Stevenson back to the minors because of it. Huh, huh. <laughs> you know, when I look at his career stats, like we uh-huh. said, you know, a 258 career hitter. But really, you take a look at those numbers and possibly his best years came when he was 30 and 30, you know, 20... Fr- 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. In fact, even later, 1941, he was leading the National League in hitting. And at one point, he had nine straight hits, one off the record. So talk wow. about how he how he possibly got better as he got older. And I think 19... 19- 41 was his best full season. He actually hit 293. Uh, he he made a point, and he he gave an interview, and I can't remember the year it was, but he made a point of of showing up either on time or even early for spring training, and he, and he kept making the comment. He said, "I got to improve my hitting." He said something like, uh, "The big money goes to the guys who can hit." And I just and I just don't hit as well as I should. So he so he worked very very hard at, 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 during spring training trying to improve his hitting, and and it fluctuated. I think one time he, he really he got he 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 was playing a game and he he was sliding into home plate and he really banged up his leg, uh, and, and he was on his, on the way to be the best hitter of and uh, best shortstop hitter that year, but uh, but. That injury really cost him. I think he was on. I think it was. I think it was batting 298 at that particular time. As a matter of fact, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. then he just he started going down. Started going down after that. The leg never did heal right, or or or, or, or I'm not sure. It might have been his arm. I think now that you mentioned it, might have been his arm. But mm-hmm. he, he definitely was injured. It might might have even been 35. But. Uh, but uh, I cover that a little bit in the book, but off the top of my head, I just can't remember mm-hmm. what year what year it was. But he, but he, but he, uh, as I said, he really did hustle. I, uh, I think he got married um, in, uh, uh, let's see, in 1933 in Reading, Pennsylvania. He he got married, and uh, one sports writer felt that she must have provided him with quote inspiration, as later on that day, on June 28, 1933, he got six hits and a double header and a home run, <laughs> including a home run, you know, and the Cubs won both games, you mm-hmm. know? So, uh, by the way, we, we should go back and just mention that those good seasons, especially that 1941 season was while he was playing for the New York giants. Giants. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, what would you say are the greatest highlights of his playing career? Let's see. Um, that's a that's a really good question. Um, he he said his own personal highlights was was playing in like uh, uh, in 1935 when he when when uh, uh, the, the Cubs won uh, Cubs went to the World Series in 1935, but they they the Cubs won uh, uh, 21 games in a row, and he really loved being in that particular, helping out with that winning streak of 21 games in a row in 1935, and it helped it helped them, you know, win the National League pennant. Then he played, you know, with uh, with the call shot. He was there for the call shot. He was also in the 1938 World Series, and, and he always said, "I was there for all these all these games with the 1938 World Series with Gabby Hartnett when Gabby Hartnett hit a home run, the homer in the gloaming, so to speak, when the when the Excuse me. When the the doctors were setting over Wrigley Field, 
and uh, 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 they were playing the Pirates, and uh, the the game was almost on the line for the National League pennant on September 28th, and uh, Gabby Hartnett, right before the game was to be called, hit the home run, which won mm. the game. He was mm. he was really he was really proud of that. As far as Billy's own personal achievements go, I I, I know he I, I kept noticing that he kept on getting ejected and kept on you know <laughs> getting in you know, all these fights and everything. And I and I I think I'm, I can't think of any particular. Well, he had a, you know like the game and after he got married, he really helped win that game. Uh, I know. Uh, the very first game he played in, when 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 Hornsby brought him back from, from in spring training in 1931, uh, he got he instantly he fielded a a really a sharp grounder and uh, and and threw the ball to first base and and Hornsby commented that you know this guy can really be a good shortstop. So his his whole scrappiness, his ability, his solid defensive skills, I I, I think those are his throughout his whole career as a base as a baseball player were the highlights mm-hmm. well one thing you know we said that uh his career batting average of 258 you know it's solid and it, it's not great it's not the worst but the one thing he didn't do a lot of was strike out um he had a pretty good right. eye at the plate um yeah. Yeah. we also talked about the fact that you know he was a manager and afterwards you know he scouted for washington and houston and the mets and several other clubs he was a baseball lifer. When you look back at his career, how would you classify it? Oh, um, in fact, Billy, Billy, can, well, let me say one more thing. When, uh, when, uh, when you, we were talking about him being a hitter, I think it was in 1935, the 1935 World Series, uh, at the very last game, uh, 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 smiling Stan Hack. Stan Hack hit a, I think, a triple and uh, and there were three out. No, you know, the very first player of the of the of the last game was Stan Hack. He hit a triple, and all the rest of the Cubs failed to advance him. And 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 Billy Jurgis was the very last person who you know grounded out or whatever. Mm. And that's what led him to come to spring training the next year really early, and and really work hard because that I can't get that whole image of uh, of Stan Hack standing forlornly on third on third base here. And, uh, um, and that but, next sorry, year, well, that next year, yeah. 1936, he hit 280. So obviously right. he did uh-huh. something because he hit yeah. 280 and 36 and he hit 298 and 37. So those were some of his best seasons. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Right. Uh, uh-huh. and, and that's what led, I could, I forgot about that, but that was, that really stuck with him. His fail, his failure to get on base and an old uh, Stan Hack standing there for lonely on third. But I'm sorry, Warren, what was your question? The other question. Well, when you look guess, back uh, at his career, how would you classify it? What would you say about Billy's career? Oh, um, he, he himself made the comment that, uh, something to the fact that, that he played the game hard. He played it to win. He says, all my life, I have, I have, I've given all my life to baseball. Baseball has done all right by me, but I have done all, all, all the best that I could for baseball. Mm. So he just, he played hard, played it to win. Phil, um, Phil uh, uh, Cavaretta made the same comment once in an interview. You know, after Billy got traded to the to the, uh, to the Giants, said, why would you trade a Billy Jurgis? He said, Billy would go through, would play everything for you. He would go through a brick wall for you. And that's why I like to think of his career. You know, he would go through a brick, brick wall, brick wall to win. In fact, after he got traded uh, uh, to the Giants, he said, "Well, I'm going to bring a, I'm going to bring a pennant to to, uh, to New York." He never, he didn't do it, but uh, mm-hmm. and he stayed with the team to 1945. But uh, uh, but he still played really hard. Mm-hmm. So I think of him as a, the word "scrappy" came up a lot in the interviews I read. That mm-hmm. uh, you know he he brooked no interference. He wouldn't he wouldn't back down to anybody. Not mm-hmm. anybody would he ever back down. But he was still he, again. He I said I play hard and I play to win. He was one. You know, I think uh, in in uh, in baseball today I can't remember the, the expression, but I think uh, 
Scott Boris, you know, the, the famous. Sure, uh, the uh, agent. Yeah, the agent. Yeah, he was commenting that some players is going through the motions deliberately, you know, not even trying hard to win. He said, you got to get out of this whole mindset. They knew they weren't going to win anything until he was going through the motions. He, he, he had even a word for it. I can't remember the name of the word now. But uh, that wasn't Billy Jurgis at all. You know, yeah. uh, he was always out there, you know, try, hustling, you know, hustling. He was, he was a... Uh, Mr. Hustle before Ch- Pete Rose, I think. <laughs> you <know? laughs> when you were doing the research for your book, what surprised oh, you most? What uh, did you uncover that surprised you the most about Billy's career? Um, I think the one thing that that really surprised me more than any a couple things about Violet that really surprised me, but the thing about about Billy was that about the whole call shot. Uh, as I said before, did, did not fall along partisan lines, you know, and that, uh, uh, you know, some Cubs players said he did and some New York players said he did not. And so we'll, we'll never really agree. You know, entire books have been written about the call shot. But that really surprised me uh, that, uh, uh, about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and also the fact that that Billy bounced back so soon after the shooting. You know, he right. got shot on July 6th. He was in court on uh, uh, on July 15th. He was back on the field on July 22nd. You know, that really surprised me as well. That mm-hmm. uh, he could just, you know, I don't think that would happen nowadays. You know, but, I mean, shot three times. You know, yeah, yeah. And everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you, you know. also mentioned that that. Uh, what surprised you most? I asked you what surprised you most about Billy, and you said something about Violet. What surprised you about Violet? Oh, um, uh, that, that that she had such an, a, a, a turbulent upbringing and, and, and a, an abusive father. You know, they don't just excuse her behavior, but they really kind of explain why she wanted a close relationship with Billy. I thought, you know, and I said the photograph. She looked so happy and early in life. You almost felt sorry for her. Uh, and then I also learned that uh, about her, she, 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 Billy, Billy did not sign a complaint against her, but, you know, right after she was, went to the arraignment, went to court on July 15th, uh, she said she was going to go home and be with her mother for a while. Well, you know, that didn't last long because on the, on the day uh, Billy went back to play for the Cubs on July 22nd, she made her she made her debut on the stage in a singing contract uh, <laughs> in a burlesque house, a real seedy burlesque house. And, and the thing I really wanted to find out was that, you know, what exactly went, went what exactly did she do on this, on, during her career here? You know, and, and, I, and I went through all of the Chicago newspapers at that time, page by page on microfilm, you know, and uh, so there's got to be a review of her show. And uh, there was a marvelous ad, I think, in the New York, uh, Chicago Herald and Examiner that, that talked about her uh, at Chicago's most famous burlesque theater, the State Congress, Violet Valley, and her Bear Cub Girls. And we're not talking B E A R, Bear Cub Girls. <laughs> <laughs> and she billed herself as the girl who shot for love. You know, for my man, you can't make this stuff up. You know, and but I did find I was going through the Chicago Daily t- uh, Daily News, and see these papers. People think all this available online. Well, the tribute is available online, but for 1932, I couldn't find any Chicago newspapers available online, not even through <laughs> newspapers.com. So I had to get them on microfilm and go through them page by page. And the Chicago Daily News had this marvelous, long story about Bilas Act and all about the Bear Cub Girls and what went on in their act, which really intrigued me. And uh, my, my colleagues at my library were always teasing me because, I, Jack, you, you're checking out all these books on burlesque here. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I did. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd sneak behind the desk and give them to my, one of my friends because I don't want the student aide to see me check out all these books here. <laughs> no. But uh, but I, I just want to learn more about what went on in the, in the burlesque show. And, and there were these, there were dancers and the degree of, of nudity depended upon how much, uh, about on the how much of the audience applause each girl got, yeah. and and Bali had a great big showing because people wanted to take her to wanted her to take off her clothes, and so the <laughs> theater was pretty well packed. But you know, all she did was go out singing to a you know a popular tune of the time. The review said, and then she she sang well, not remarkable. The reviewer said, but well, and then she just 
you know, smiled and bowed and walked off the stage. It talked about the stage hands in their undershirts were all there, you know, leering at her, you know, when she went up to the micro, went up to the, uh, the center of the stage. Uh, but you now she just sang and walked off the stage and uh, said much to the disappointment of the, of the, of the young men in the theater. And I, and I was surprised that the, the reviewer was a guy named Lloyd Lewis, who I found out later uh, was one was a very famous newspaper man at the time. He was the drama critic of the Chicago Daily News. He hobnobbed with the elite of the day, of the day. He was an amateur historian. Wrote a book on the Civil War. Hobnobbed with Carl Sandburg, who's a Civil War historian. He knew Sinclair Lewis. You know, he wrote The Jungle and Babbitt and Main Street. And he he lived in a house on the Des Plaines River, which is now a national historic or an Illinois mm. status uh, landmark, designed by his buddy Frank Lloyd Wright. Oh wow. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, and he wrote this really long review that I just happened to find ser- you know, by serendipity. You know, I had to went through these, and, and and that was a really that just I almost screamed Eureka when I came across that because that was something <laughs> I really wanted to find. You know, just what went on, and I found out later. I, it was supposed to run for like six weeks. But I kept on seeing the illusion, uh, references in the paper about how, how she used to be in the state congress theater and so i asked her 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 nephew about this and he said well you know quote uh sh- uh she liked to sing that is she tried to sing uh, <laughs> she, and, and uh and it only lasted just a few weeks but i think what i think she probably was a pretty good singer but the fact that she wasn't really you know taken off her clothes is what doom, doomed it because burlesque was really popular and she was mm-hmm. singing on the burlesque circuit, you know, and they were, she was expected to, you know, participate. Uh, but anyway, the, the Bear Cub girls are what did the did the stripping, not Violet. Mm. Well, your book, The Chicago Cubs, Shot for Love, A Showgirl's Crime of Passion, and the 1932 World Series. I'm sure there's a lot more really cool little nuggets and stories in there. Jack, where can people get a copy of your book? Uh, it's available on Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble. And, uh, also I, uh, I had professional book plates made that, that show the image of the book. And if anyone ever gets a copy, I'll be glad to just email me and I'll be glad to send them a signed and inscribed book plate for their own copy of the book. But at Amazon is readily available on Amazon. And, uh, my email address is just J Bales, J B as in boy, A L E S like Bales of hay. J Bales at U M W dot E D U. That stands for University of Mary Washington. I'm a, a former librarian. Okay. But I'll be glad to send a signed book plate to anybody who wants one. Awesome. That's that's awesome. Well, yeah. Jack, I want to thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. It has been yeah. a very enjoyable <laughs> conversation. I am so glad that that uh we hooked up and um yeah thank you so much for joining me oh i thoroughly enjoyed it why it's been marvelous talking to you i love all your questions i love you know all these spirited comments about what we love so much about the sport and everything and about you know billy jurgis and this just remarkable incident in baseball history well again jack thank you so much for joining me and um you know Maybe we'll uh, we'll get back together again to talk about uh, something else you could be working on. Okay, thanks a lot, Warren. Thank you very much for having me, too. You got it. Awesome. Jurgis spent 17 years in the majors. He started his career with the Cubs, his best season coming in 1937 when he hit 298 and was an All-Star. Overall, with the Cubs, he played with them for 10 years, batted 254 with 20 home runs and 390 RBI. In his seven years with the New York Giants, he hit 264 with 23 home runs and 266 RBI. He played in three fall classics and hit 275, but the teams for whom he played never came out on top. As a manager, he took over the reins of the Boston Red Sox midway through the 1959 season and went 44-36, and but he was let go in early 1960 after starting the year 15-27. and But it was his relationship and the events afterwards with Violet Valley, 
along with the individual moments of his career that he will best be remembered for. I want to thank author Jack Bales for spending time with us to talk about Billy's career. Please check out his book, The Chicago Cub Shot for Love. It's really an interesting topic, and Jack did a terrific job of putting this book together. And as always, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Humans. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.